pleasure to speak with you today. Hi, Liz. So I I've got, don't have a lot of time with you, so I want to just dive in. So as a survivor of the original holiday special, <laughs> what what is it meant to you to be involved with this particular version? You are so right. I was horrified when they came to me and said, we are making a uh, an animation called the holiday special. And I said, are you crazy? People remember, they'll hate you for doing it again. And of course, when you see the script and the program, it's totally different. But I talk about the, the holiday special in my new out in paperback book, uh, IMC 3 po The Inside Story. And one of my favorite chapters in there is about the original holiday special, how it felt on the set and how my I was so happy to escape from it. But this one is totally different. And they very quickly reassured me. First of all, we're all Lego. And who doesn't like Lego? Who doesn't like all those critters being the same size and walking in that strange, not even robotic, but it's kind of lumpy way that is so cute. And, you know, all their head turns to just everybody's lumpy. And I know that's one of Chewbacca's cousins or something from the original. Oh, God, you see, it's in my head. Um, and this one, yeah, Lego. And in Lego, you can poke fun at the, the big, the big, beer moth that is in Star Wars and all that it means to millions and millions and millions of people around the planet. You know, we all know Star Wars is just a global, massive thing that is revered and loved. But when is something so big and revered and loved? You can tease it, you can poke fun of it because at heart we all love it. And so Lego is teasing here. They're taking you on adventures that you wouldn't normally be able to go on, uh, meet people together that wouldn't normally mix, and so on, and all heading to this great event that Wookiees live for, Life Day. And that is so echoes a lot of stuff that we as humans do on our planet. You know, we've all got our religious festivals that have a high point. Maybe this year it's going to be slightly lower, and we've got to get through that and move on to next year. This year is to have this program out um, that you can enjoy at home on a screen near you by yourself. It's full of love and affection and warmth if you're by yourself. And if you're with a family, it's going to echo what, what's around you. Until, of course, the family row breaks up. It breaks <laughs> out at Christmas. Normally would with people put together for too long. You know, in terms of doing this character, do you feel possessive of him at a certain level? Like, you, you, unlike a lot of Star Wars characters, you're consistently, relatively consistently, usually doing the voice. That is a very, very um, perceptive question. Um, D Disney and Lucasfilm would be horrified to think I had <clears throat> any sense of possession about it. And they've always been very clear. It's theirs. He belongs to us. Be grateful. But yes, I've... I have to be very careful um, um, about how I feel possessive about him <clears throat> because he's not, he isn't me, he doesn't belong to me. But because I've been doing him so long, I'm the kind of guardian of who he is on this planet. And I've, I've said that to JJ, I am his spokesperson on this planet. And um, if people are sensible, they kind of listen to me that I have the history here that 3PO wouldn't actually behave like that because it was out of character, out of, dialogue, his vocabulary, whatever. And, and most people um, kind of say, oh, thanks, thanks for the advice, yeah, we'll change it. You know, nothing big, it's just there are little moments that make 3PO the consistent character from your child and from your parents' uh, lifetime, younger days, that he has to stay the same. Absolutely. One thing I definitely want to ask you about, when people talk to you about the relationship between C-3PO and R2-D2, how do you describe it? Is it, is it, are they just good friends? Is it a long lasting marriage? It, it is like, there's that wonderful film, The Odd Couple, uh, you'll remember where these two guys, different personalities, but they, they have little, uh, little connections between each other. And one of the things, of course, between those two droids is they go on, horrible adventures that, that <clears throat> bring out the best and the worst in them. And I, one of the things I liked in George's script originally was the way he had written, um, you know, this, this humanoid figure and this box, an utter, utterly believable um, relationship, dialogue, and so on, that you really felt you were talking to, to listening to two humans. The shocking thing for me, the genuinely shocking thing for me was on the first day of filming, 
six months after I had begun my involvement with Costia. There we were in the desert. And in all that time, nobody had said to me, you realize R2D2 does not make any sound. That will be put in later. So on day one, I'm going, ah, I don't understand how to do this. I'm acting with, with this thing that doesn't relate to me and I'm having to have a conversation. And I got through it. And of course, in the end, it was Ben Burt who put on those wonderful beeps and burbles and whistles and those funny noises that slotted around my dialogue, monologue. So when I saw the original, I was absolutely thrilled at Ben Burt having created um, the other half of, of the act and making it such a lovable thing that we, we see the humanity in there for all its, its good and, and naughty side and its, uh, its, its frustration, because they're put in very frustrating uh, situations, as are most of us, for heaven's sake. You know, time is a bit frustrating at the moment, and uh, today has been a little weird. So, but um, fortunately, Artu isn't here today to uh, annoy me. Um, so it's that's good. Wonderful. Well, that's my time with you. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, and uh, happy Life Day, and uh, may the force be with you. And with you.